I will now pass it over to Eric with the ICP team. We wanted to focus tonight on the, the work that we can do remotely. And so um, we'll, we'll explore what work can be done um, in locations without a country office. Then Edrolfo from Nicaragua will be talking about the work we can do in country offices. Uh, Pat Coyle from San Francisco Pro will talk about um, that chapter's experience delivering projects remotely. And then Kevin from CE Corp, or from ESC will present about um, ESC's remote work. So we'll go forward first to the next slide. So um, remote work is not a, a new uh, phenomenon uh, for the international community program. Um, remote work has been growing steadily over the last three years and you can see kind of the numbers there. And when we talk about remote work, what we're talking about is moving a project forward when travel to the country is not possible. So you can ima imagine there's a lot of challenges um, that come from this. And if we go to the next slide, we can talk about some of the considerations that each project team will need to work through um, to determine if moving the project forward remotely is the right option. You can kind of think about the, the typical three-legged project management stool um, when you're considering um, moving your project forward. So some important things to consider are um, quality of the work and safety. Can that be maintained working remotely? Do you have um, the proper on the ground support, both technically and from a financial perspective to be able to deliver your project? Do you have good communication channels to um, both coordinate the, the collection of, work, of data and also manage any field changes you might find? Um, you may be looking at um, expanding some of your um, existing design documents to better support remote work uh, if you can't be on the field to manage, uh, be in the field to manage those field changes and surprises you might encounter. And then the other one is considering schedule and cost. Um, and so um, each team is going to have to make a very uh, important and difficult decision to kind of um, balance all those things out and, and determine if it's right. And I, the best step to, the first step that's best to take is to reach out to your PE. Um, we've been having these calls regularly with chapters and, and we've um, experienced it over the last two to three years and learned a lot of lessons on what works. And we, we're always happy to talk through what's possible for your project. And, and in some cases, it, it, it doesn't make sense. But in a lot of cases, there are steps we can take to move the project forward. And then once you've made the decision um, to move the project forward, there's a lot of key things that you can do. Um, I've highlighted four of the, the most important ones here. Um, and we've also put together um, a revamped article on remote phase work that's live on the site right now. So if you search remote uh, in Volunteer Village, you can get to that article that has a detailed checklist of all the things to consider, um, as well as a step-by-step -step checklist as you walk um, through the process of delivering a project remotely. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Edrolfo, who will be able to talk about um, all of the different um, uh, opportunities that are available from the country offices to support remote work. You can go forward to. You can go forward one more. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, hi, this is Edrolfo Rodriguez, uh, Nicaragua Country Manager. So I, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about our experience with remote work here in Nicaragua. Um, as Eric mentioned, remote work means working in the project but from the distance, depending on different aspects. We as a country office experienced in 2018 a uh, uh, social um, rising and uh, there were some issues that uh, put us in a place where there was a travel suspension for Nicaragua. So that's where we started doing more of the remote work for the chapters. Um, and during that experience, we identified some of the phases where we actually provide uh, support to the chapters. One being the planning of the remote assistance, uh, either implementation, assessment, or monitoring and evaluation. There needs to be a lot of planning between the chapter, the country office, and the local partners, which also includes contractors at some points to define the best pathway to move the project forward. 
Um, of course, there's a lot of coordination going, uh, going on and chapters need to rely a lot on the local regional coordinators to make the communication flowing between uh, chapter and community. Um, there's a lot of uh, back and forth with emails, but also we find that the WhatsApp, it's a great application to be in touch with the local communities because usually there's enough um, access to that platform in, in rural areas here in Nicaragua. Um, of course, there's uh, there needs to be some financial aspects to be considered. For example, sending the budget on time for uh, making material procurement um, and having everything ready before the project is actually built. Um, so I'm usually in charge of helping chapters how to go about sending money from either their accounts within EWB or their university universities if, if it's a um, student chapter. Um, the, the most important component, I think, is the field supervision because we have engineers uh, in-house that are able to either supervise contractors that the chapter hire or supervise Mason or local labor from the community to make sure that the plans and designs are being followed as intended. And finally, there's a lot of problem solving because you know things usually don't come up as planned. So the country office um, has to have a lot of communication with the chapter. That's why it's really important that the chapter appoints one or two of their members to be available at any time uh, should they need to be contacted by the country office for any arising um, issue. Next slide, please. So um, some of the things that we have um, identified in, ter in terms of issues and some ways that chapters can help to solve those out is one being the chapter motivation, because I, I, we know that one important part of your project is your engagement with the community and your personal relationship with the community members. So chapters and some members may lose motivation because they're not being able to work in the field. Um, and we believe that the best way is to keep your engagement with the community through the remote opportunities, like as I mentioned WhatsApp before, or um, requesting visual updates from the work progress, like pictures or audio files from your community um, where they express how happy they are because their projects are moving forward. Um, also, there are some last minute changes uh, in the science or plan, and this is really important to have an open communication with your PE and your field engineer. So these decisions um, are made by the chapter. We as country office don't make decisions over the science. We need to wait until the chapter have a final saying because we need to follow those design. Uh, it's really important. Um, and in terms of problems with money, uh, sometimes the money runs out and the chapter needs to send more money for completing material procurement. What we have done in the past is that we uh, buy material upfront and then request reimbursement. But in order to avoid it, it's really important to have a solid budget and, and sh um, send that to the country office in advance. And finally, there might be some lack of trust with your implementing partner. Maybe it's a contractor that you're just hearing about, and that's why it's really important to build a relationship ahead of time. We can schedule calls between contractors and the chapter members so they know each other and they talk about plans and, and have that relationship going. And if there's something that you don't like and you don't feel uh, good about, you can speak up, you can let us know that you feel something is not right, and we can sort things out. So. Um, these are the main things that we, I wanted to share with you. Now I'm just going to pass you to uh, Pat Coyle, who is with San Francisco Professional Chapter, and they're just uh, in uh, implementation right now with us. So Pat, up to you. Thanks so much, Adrufo. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our remote implementation experience with this um, joint Engineers Without Borders San Francisco Professionals and UC Berkeley project. And I want to stress the joint part of that because from the get-go we've been partnered with them. So this, the, the prior scene was a, a view of the community overlooking it from Peña Labrada, which is a high, this is in the central highlands of Nicaragua, 90 kilometers from Managua. But El Lanito is a community of about 300 homes, 1,100 people. The water supply is primarily a uh, uh, a hundred foot well with a hand pump and some people walk a mile or more up and down hills to get their daily water. 
They've had the well since 2002, but have been waiting 20 years for a water distribution system. So as I mentioned, this is a close run from, uh, it's like uh, the, slides, the slide's a little clipped on my screen, but basically from the airport uh, up to, uh, through Boaco and, and up to Santa Lucia, which is the, the municipality of which El Nito is one of the 15 or so communities around there. That's about a two hour kind of a drive to get up there. My point being is you can catch a red eye into Nicaragua, uh, be there in the morning and be at the project site by mid afternoon. This is just a, 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 an overall diagram of our distribution system uh, from our AutoCAD design. This just primarily presents the overall distribution, the location of the well, and the location of the storage tanks. This was the existing condition. This is that 100-foot well and how it's used. And uh, this is the reason for this. Uh, if you look at these, mostly women carrying five-gallon pails of water. There's about 40 pounds on their head and shoulders. There's a strong incentive to reduce the travel time, and it's trying to really mitigate this problem. That's the scope. I won't read all of these elements, but you can, you can see here from the well support building and connection to the utility power, uh, putting a submersible electric pump in that well, our distribution system, about four kilometers of pipeline, a couple of pressure brake tanks, all the rest of it there, 50 meter tap stands. So people will still be carrying water to their homes in the initial period of use of this system, but they'll have a much shorter walk to get to it. And I just wanna stress the kinds of things that Adrulfo did, that it's, it's really the combination. We all who are doing ICP projects know about the importance of the NGO and our community-based organization. When you add a country office to that mix and you've got strong, uh, in our case, the water committee is the community-based organization, and the community commitment behind them, you have a, a really strong combination that's just been essential to the success of this project. And the very close coordination between the country office, our NGO partner, Alcanza Nicaragua, and our water committee uh, has been really crucial. And in terms of the kinds of things that, that were done that, that, that really were, were so huge for us, the country office conducted trainings, they performed water tests, they acted as our procurement agent and placed contracts. They arranged material delivery, provided engineering and technical support and services. They hired and paid our local mason and foreman to lead volunteers. And going to the, the story about getting those funds in there uh, that, that Adrufo touched on, we started with Engineers Without Borders funds. And then this is a rotary global grant funded project, uh, contributing a major chunk of it, almost $37,000 uh, has been uh, expended there and we 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 paid out on that that rotary funding based on receipts or quotations from the country office so we buy this stuff with our engineers without borders funds we'd reimburse the country office with our rotary global grant funds until we burn through that 37k and then we will complete the project with ewb funding and so this was just a busy 2018 this is a uh, go by real fast but basically the community was, uh, our NGO helped to get uh, the community to look at our, our alternatives analysis in a series of meetings. They also elected their, their water committee and got it formalized as a CAPS. Uh, the country office came out and trained the CAPS and, and one of those slides included a, a photograph of our rotary uh, in-country partner from the Messiah Rotary who was at the, the wells taking a look there. And then we, we did have the good fortune, as Adrufo mentioned, the civil unrest had meant that we were planning to do this project remotely. And then there was uh, 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 enough change in the situation that, that with strict safety protocols, we were able to travel. So we arrived on the 29th of December and we we're, were there through January 18th on what we referred to as an early implementation, which was to get this little uh, well support building uh, constructed and start the pipeline make sure that everything that we needed people to do while we weren't there after we left, that we had high confidence that they were trained and, and able to do that. Uh, and everybody got a chance to be involved and get trained on that pipeline installation. It was really great for cementing all our relationships with the partners. This video, uh, you can find all these images in our trip report. Basically, these are the content of our post-trip report. At this community kickoff meeting, we had 160 plus community members there. This is our lead foreman, Martin, using his fixture to be able to check the width and depth of a trench without having to pull out a tape measure. Groundbreaking for the well support site. This is in a neighboring community where emergency water 
uh, problem has resulted in uh, the NGO helping them get those IBC totes. Uh, this is the start of construction of the well support uh, buildings lab. We saw some of our UC Berkeley. We had five young women travel on this this trip, and they they were uh, played a pivotal part in it. There they are, working at the well support building and actually getting their hands dirty. Uh, nearly complete here. Uh, Pretty extensive uh, hilly terrain to trench in, and we thought this was going to be a real problem. But by the time we were done uh, in our stay there, uh, they had 90% of the trenching done. These are valve boxes, and we tried to do first articles of each one of these uh, junction boxes for valves. Two inch distribution mains. Here's the, one of the first tap stands. Um, this is a, a, a pipe pressure testing rig that Steve Isaacs. From the West Coast Tax sure, Show. So that was a nice bit of EWB share. Here's Phil Bowman, our responsible engineer in charge. One of the completed tap stands, and myself walking with the water board members staking the tap. The continuing down. implementation from when we left in January 19th to present, because of the relationships and because of the support from the country office, we're able to uh, go ahead and finish all of that four kilometers of pipelines, like pipelines all 50 of the tap stands, all the rest of the stuff is done now. And uh, uh, Martine led that work and we had weekly visits from the country office engineer, Evelyn was able to come and support us. She was on site for all critical work like electrical installation in the pump house. And, and Phil was our, our point of contact. That's a really key point that, that Adrufo made is you have to have somebody ready to answer the mail. And that meant daily, almost daily kind of communication via WhatsApp and, and Google Translate. Phil and my Spanish isn't the greatest and so forth to resolve issues, approve material purchase, just anything that comes up. So we whipped through these real quick. You can see kind of these are just give you. This was an interesting one of the, the river crossings. We have one other case where we actually suspended the pipeline uh, aerially, but in most cases we buried them. In this case, we had this, this bridge to strap onto. I, I just want to sum up here that I think the EWB 2.0 strategy where we focus ICP work in countries where we've got country offices has really paid off for our individual project success. The Nicaragua country office team, uh, they're very capable and they're really a pleasure to work with. We've been very fortunate to have the level of commitment, engagement, and capacity in the El Lanito community, and our NGO partners in Alcanza, Nicaragua, are first-class community facilitators, and their members live in and around the, this community and, and in another location where they have another office. These pre-trip calls and WhatsApp and Zoom sessions and coordination from the very beginning of this project inception have helped us have a good reservoir of mutual trust. Our on-site visit just reinforced that relationship with everyone. And I would remind people again that remote implementation really requires frequent, almost daily communication and rapid decisions and responses by the chapter.